Hi, I'm um, Phil Swanson. I'm the Hughes Professor of Spanish at the University of Sheffield, and I'm a specialist in Latin American literature and culture, and I also work on um, the ways in which Latin America is represented and imagined from, from the outside. And that can be a bit of a tricky position to, to be in sometimes, because as you can see, I'm, I'm white, um, I'm male, slightly older, uh, European, British, and an academic. Um, and so it can be problematic at times for, for me to seem to be telling Latin Americans about their own culture. Uh, and that can also be an issue in, the, in North America, particularly the United States, which has a, obviously a very large uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, or Latinx community. And the fact that I've just used several different terms there shows how sensitive the terminology is uh, around the sort of matters of sort of uh, identity. Um, so it, it is a very potentially a very tricky area when somebody from the outside, like me, in a sense, uh, talks about sort of uh, Hispanic American or American or Latin American culture. So that raises the question of you know who can speak, yeah? who is allowed to speak about others. Uh, is it appropriate that somebody in my position um, speaks about the identity and experiences of um, Latin Americans, uh, the Hispanic USA, uh, Latin women, indigenous peoples? Um, when I talk about Latin America, am I inevitably going to be doing that through the lens of Anglo-American or European literary criticism? And when a literary critic like me talks about sort of Latin America, for example, you know, is there a risk that uh, I will be sort of um, universalizing the experience of Latin Americans and therefore depoliticizing it? Uh, is there a risk of me exoticizing that experience or diminishing it in some way? So the perspectives I express in my work may not always be uh, shared and may not always be popular. Um, having said that, I do think you know, people like me can, to some degree at least, illuminate aspects of um, Latin American culture to Latin, for Latin Americans. Um, and of course, what we can do is also is expose or bring Latin American culture to um, a wider uh, non-Latin audience and hopefully uh, generate interest, engagement, and uh, empathy. Well, this problem of who can speak was recently foregrounded very powerfully in the USA in a controversy that spread to the rest of the world. In 2020, there was a huge hoo-ha around the publication of the novel American Dirt by Janine Cummins. So now somebody perceived as non-Hispanic was seen to be writing about the harrowing experiences of a Mexican mother and child trying to escape the murderous Mexican drug cartels as they sought to try and flee Acapulco and make their way across the Mexican-US border to reach the safety of the USA. Cummins was accused of appropriating experiences of which she herself had no direct knowledge. Um, and she was accused of exploitation of others and of peddling what was called trauma porn. American Dirt tells the story of um, a bookshop owner called Lydia and her son Luca. Now Lydia's investigative journalist husband uh, has written an expose about the leader of a notorious and violent drug cartel. This man is called the Owl. Um, and the Owl basically orders a, a reprisal against Lydia's husband and her family are viciously slaughtered uh, during a 15th birthday party um, when Sebastian is preparing a family barbecue. Lydia and her son Luca now have to go on the run to escape the cartel and they try and um, escape to North America where Lydia has a distant cousin in Colorado and she hopes that that will be a sort of a safe haven for her. Um, now most of the novel then describes the, 
the mother and son's harrowing experiences or traumatic experiences as they try and make their way north. And they escape largely by using the, the uh, rail networks which go through sort of Mexico towards the border. And these are known as La Bestia, the beast, or the train is often referred to as La Bestia or the beast. And after that, of course, they need to then cross uh, the border with the aid, with the aid of coyotes or, or, or people smugglers. Okay. So what I'm going to do is read uh, a short extract from the novel. And um, this is where Lydia takes the decision to um, run the risk of boarding La Bestia with her son. They're not the first to go. Acapulco is emptying of its people. How many of her neighbors have fled in the last year? How many have disappeared? After all those years of watching it happen elsewhere, of indulging their remote pity, of shaking their heads, the stream of migrants flowed past them at a distance from south to north. Acapulco has joined the procession, she realizes. No one can stay in a brutal, blood-stained place. The possible manners of death available on La Bestia are all gruesome. You can be crushed between two moving cars when the train rounds a bend. You can fall asleep, roll off the edge, get sucked beneath the wheels, have your legs sliced off. When that happens, if the migrant isn't killed instantly, he usually bleeds to death in a remote corner of some farmer's field before anyone finds him. And finally, there's the ubiquity of ordinary human violence. You can die by beating or stabbing or shooting. Robbery is a foregone conclusion. Mass abductions for ransom are commonplace. Often, kidnappers torture their victims to help persuade their families to pay. On the trains, a uniform seldom represents what it purports to represent. Half the people pretending to be migrants, or coyotes, or train engineers, or police, or la migra, are working for the cartel. Everybody's on the take. Here's a Guatemalan man, 22 years old, who lost both legs. He's missing a front tooth as well. Somebody told me before we got on the train, he says, if you fall, you see your arm or your leg getting sucked under there. You have a split second to decide whether or not to put your head in there too. The young man blinks. I made the wrong choice, he says. Lydia bows her head for a moment to assess her state of mind. Because despite everything, she also knows that, like all criminal enterprises in Mexico, La Bestia is controlled by the cartels. Perhaps she and Luca will have the same chance as anybody else at surviving the beast. Perhaps their chances will be better, in fact, because they have the means to prepare for the journey, and they've already proven themselves to be survivors. So it comes down to this. Her fears of La Bestia, the prevalence of violence, kidnapping, death, those fears feel theoretical. They don't measure up against her new blood-cold fear of the owl, the memory of her mother's green-tiled shower, that sicario eating her husband's chicken drumsticks as he stepped among the corpses of her family. Well, there is, of course, a long history of um, narratives and movies about um, the Mexican-US border and its crossings. Now, these are some examples of um, films about the border. And these represent very different perspectives, really. Some of them express North American fantasies and anxieties about the porosity, the porousness, if you like, of the North-South divide. Others tend to express more the fears and hopes of Latin Americans trying to move from the South to the North. If you don't know much about this topic, you might want to have a look at uh, one or two of these um, films. I, I would particularly recommend um, Sin Nombre, that means nameless, a lot of which is actually set on La Bestia, the beast. And that's incidentally been made by Kari Joji Fukunaga, um, who's just uh, recently completed the uh, latest James Bond film, uh, No Time to Die. Another one I'd recommend is a much earlier one, actually. It's from 1983. It's called El Norte, which means the North, uh, which is much more from the perspective of the uh, Latin American migrant. 
and it also considers and expresses the, the migrants' experiences when they actually reach the North. So it asks the question of whether life is really any better for them once they've made that transition across the border. So let's um, have a look at the American Dirt controversy. Um, well, Janine Cummins' book uh, was launched amid enormous anticipation and fanfare. It was selected for the Oprah Winfrey Book Club, or Book Club Selection, which would presumably guarantee very big sales. There was um, a massive sort of publicity campaign behind it. Cummins was notoriously offered a very huge seven-figure uh, advance and uh, there was also a film deal in the pipeline. Now in part all the publicity and all the money may explain to some degree the, the, the huge backlash uh, which followed. Um, but the main emphasis of, of that backlash was on the fact that um, a North American writer um, was exploiting or was seen as exploiting the experiences of undocumented Mexican migrants um, and possibly peddling uh, stereotypical and even offensive images of their experiences. Uh, Latino and Latina writers um, got involved, as did reviewers and critics. Uh, one writer, Miriam Gurba, um, actually alleged that um, the critical review that she was commissioned to write for the magazine Ms. Um, was pulled, or she was asked to pull it, um, or rewrite it in a more positive um, tone. Um, at this point, various authors and celebrities, actors, both Latinx and white, um, got involved and the whole sort of controversy became spectacularly viral. Um, the publishers, Flatiron Books, uh, ultimately uh, were compelled or felt compelled to announce the um, cancellation of the planned high profile book tour. And fuel was added to this fire by um, Cummins' pre release claim that she, after all, had a Puerto Rican grandmother, her claim that um, her husband had himself been an undocumented migrant, he was actually from Ireland, um, by her posting uh, images of pretty book covers uh, featuring barbed wire, and most notoriously of all, um, the decoration of a very flash American dirt uh, party, book party. Um, featuring centerpieces um, adorned with motifs of barbed wire fences. The debate that exploded across the world then was who has the right to speak or write about lives and experiences that are not their own? Specifically, can non-Latin writers ethically portray the suffering of Latin Americans or of those of Latin American heritage? Well, an alternative approach to such matters might be um, a 2019 novel by Valeria Luiselli called Lost Children Archive. Luiselli is considered a uh, serious author with a record of engaged political activism. She's also Mexican-born and, of course, has written in Spanish. Though living in the USA, she wrote Lost Children Archive in English. And that was nominated for a whole series of prizes. Just most recently, it won the Dublin Literary Award just a few weeks ago. This is a complex and sometimes heavy going novel about a family road trip from New York down to and through Arizona, in which a couple of intellectual oral historians go off on a sound recording trip with their kids, trying to capture traces or echoes of the Chiricahua Apaches and of Central American children's border crossings their incarceration in detention centres, and their deportation. So 
So I'm going to um, read a, a little extract from Lost Children Archive. This is from the mother's perspective, and it's just taking place as the family are about to sort of prepare for their road trip. Archive. I pored over reports and articles about child refugees and tried to gather information on what was happening beyond the New York Immigration Court, at the border, in detention centers and shelters. I got in touch with lawyers, attended conferences of the New York City Bar Association, had private meetings with non-profit workers and community organizers. I collected loose notes, scraps, cutouts, quotes copied down on cards, letters, maps, photographs, lists of words, clippings, tape-recorded testimonies. When I started to get lost in the documental labyrinth of my own making, I contacted an old friend, a Columbia University professor specializing in archival studies, who wrote me a long letter and sent me a list of articles and books that might shine some light on my confusion. I read and read, long sleepless nights reading about archive fevers, about rebuilding memory in diasporic narratives, about being lost in the ashes of the archive. Finally, after I'd found some clarity and amassed a reasonable amount of well-filtered material that would help me understand how to document the children's crisis at the border, I placed everything inside one of the banker's boxes that my husband had not yet filled with his own stuff. I had a few photos, some legal papers, intake questionnaires used for court screenings, maps of migrant deaths in the southern deserts, and a folder with dozens of migrant mortality reports printed from online search engines that locate the missing which listed bodies found in those deserts, the possible cause of death and their exact location. At the very top of the box, I placed a few books I'd read and thought could help me think about the whole project from a certain narrative distance. The Gates of Paradise by Jerzy Andrzejewski, The Children's Crusade by Marcel Schwab, Belladonna by Dasha Drindic, Le Goût de l'Archive by Arlette Farage, and a little red book I hadn't read yet, called Elegies for Lost Children by Asia Caposanto. Then the boy complained. Why couldn't he have a box too? We had no arguments against his demand, and so we allowed him and the girl one box. The boy said he wanted to leave his empty for now, so I can collect stuff on the way. Me too, said the girl. We argued that empty boxes would be a waste of space, but our arguments found good counter-arguments. Or perhaps we were tired of finding counter-arguments in general. So that was that. In total, we had seven boxes. They would travel with us, like an appendix of us, in the trunk of the car. So let's try and compare a little these two different novels, these two different takes on sort of uh, the border experience. Some would probably argue that um, Valeria Luiselli's novel is more challenging and is less mainstream and therefore in some sense better. Um, they would also argue that it consciously attempts to take a more ethical perspective on the migrant's dilemma and also on the position of the sympathetic reader um, who is nonetheless reading from a position of privilege. Now, there's a view that uh, appealing to sentiment actually neutralizes uh, the figure of the victim by rendering that experience universal. If we, as privileged readers, feel we can identify with the plight of the victim, then in a sense, we're not respecting the specificity of that experience, of an experience that we cannot ourselves know. Um, we feel shock and we feel outrage, perhaps, um, but that sentiment might not necessarily translate into concrete action on our part. Um, we feel, in a sense, that we've done our job uh, by simply feeling emotional about what we are reading or what we're seeing. Some might claim that this is what happens with the thrilling and hair-raising roller coaster ride that is American Dirt. They might also claim that what Lost Children Archive does is something different. By using the filter of the intellectually and politically aware recording artists who can only capture traces and echoes of the refugee experience 
that this novel therefore problematizes the moral or ethical position of the observer or outsider by forcing us to reflect on what we can know or not know, and what we can usefully say about an experience or an identity that is so alien to us. At the same time though, the very fact that this novel is written by a Mexican living in the USA and one who's worked closely with migrants gives the text a kind of legitimacy that American dirt must inevitably lack. So it's difficult for somebody who cannot fully identify with a Mexican migrant or who um, does not share the social, ethnic, regional or, or national identity. It's difficult for somebody like in that position to challenge um, a critical perspective on an author like Janine Cummins or a novel like American Dirt. But uh, we can also ask the rather tricky question, which novel would you rather read? Uh, which novel do you think would have the biggest impact on the average reader? Does complexity and difficulty really make a novel better? Um, is it not a good thing for a novelist to try and present a particular group's traumatic experience um, of a different social and political reality in an accessible way to a mainstream uh, audience who might otherwise not be likely to know very much about that reality or learn very much about that reality. And the problem is, as perhaps the two extracts I've chosen show, that American Dirt is probably a much more gripping and powerful read for most of us, and is therefore perhaps much more likely to have an impact or raise awareness in many more readers. Well, in her afterword to American Dirt, Janine Cummins says the following. When I decided to write this book, I worried that as a non-migrant and non-Mexican, I had no business writing a book set almost entirely in Mexico, set entirely amongst migrants. I wished someone slightly browner than me would write it. But then I thought, if you're a person who has the capacity to be a bridge, why not be a bridge? Well, I can offer no clear or untroubling responses to Cummins's question. And indeed, um, I think each of us would answer the question she poses and respond to the dilemma she describes in very, very different ways. Um, so this debate about who can speak remains tantalizingly and frustratingly open, but it's still a very important debate to have.